Welcome everyone to the Switch for Good podcast. I am your host, Dotsy Bausch, and here with the lovely Alexandra Paul. Hi, Dotsy. How are you? Amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> you are for amazing. This guest. You are. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in DC last week for because a very you're a cool setter. event. You are oh. everywhere just spreading the vegan word. Loving what the you planes. And because I'm on a whole food plant based <laughs> diet. Um, I didn't get sick the last 10 flights I've taken, and that used to happen a lot in, in, in my life. So I'm on a roll. So I'm getting on one next week, and I hope I didn't just jinx myself. Uh, but something is just crazy extraordinary that's going to happen this year. And um, why I was in D.C. Uh, was a press conference for what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, Earth Day Network and the Yale Program on Climate Change um, hosted a panel discussion last week, which released new research on a report that is titled Climate Change in the American Diet, which was commissioned by uh, Earth Day Network. Uh, and the exciting aspect is, is that for the first time in 49 years, Earth Day is going to bring into the conversation the pressure and the toll that animal agriculture and the standard American diet, the food that we eat every day, um, and how that is affecting what is happening to our climate. So for 49 years, this has never been a, a conversation, right? It was mostly surrounding um, you know, fossil fuels, uh, et cetera, and they are bringing that conversation in. So this is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It's going to be celebrated on the DC Mall in front of about 600,000 people. Uh, the celebration is on the 25th. Earth Day is actually the 22nd, which will be a climate march in DC. That's a Wednesday. But Saturday is the big celebration, the big party where you know Metallica's playing and Pharrell and Billie Eilish and, and, and all of those. And so uh, this is just a groundbreaking moment, moment for, for our movement and for what we, and especially you, because you have been working um, so hard and so diligently and so passionately for so long about the connection between the food that's on our plate and and the climate. Congratulations, because I know Switch for Good, Dotsy, of which you are executive director and founder, you have worked really hard to get this on the agenda. Really hard. Yeah, we're going to have a exciting uh, moment on stage um, on Earth Day. I'm, I keep asking if we can go uh, right before Metallica, so we'll see if they put us <laughs> in the lineup, as I'm hoping but it's athletes and it's a broadcast commercial. Are you guys going to dance or something? Some, well, goodness, I hope not. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea for a bunch of athletes. <laughs> We're going to have to do it another way. Sing? <laughs> Find some other way. That will not be a good idea Okay, either, well, folks, I'll have to tune in to see what you do on that big stage with those athletes. Yeah. Great. Yeah, We're going to make it happen. But, Thank um, you, Dotsie. So... Uh, well, Crazy let me, exciting, right? Yeah. Because the guest we are going, we are talking about a book that has just released on hormones, hormones, hormones. Everyone's talking about them all the time. I know I am males, females, whatever it is. And uh, it released February 4th. We have a return guest today. Yes, yeah. Neil, Dr. Neil Barnard was on episode 22. So please listen to that before even diving in if you want, or listen to it after because you can we learn about Dr. Barnett. I think we talked about Dr. Barnett and his smoking and his his rock and roll. So <laughs> you, had, you had to re-listen to that because because we're not going to go into all that today because we're talking about hormones the whole time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, exactly. So take up the hour. Uh, so today, yeah, he's talking about hormones, specifically the ones we eat or don't eat. And his brand new book is called Your Body in Balance, The New Science of Food, Hormones, and Health. And both you and I read it. And it was incredible. Very eye-opening. It explains the relationship between hormones and health and how we can heal a host of issues from acne to infertility um, to obesity simply by switching up our diets. Dr. Barnard is the author of 20 books. He's the founder of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Med Medicine, and he's a practicing researcher, physician, and professor. So we listen when he gives advice. <laughs> that is for yes, sure, right? Yes, so And do. so many other people. He is yeah. coming to us from Miami, actually. Uh, so thank you from his hotel room in Miami. Hi, Dr. Barnard. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be back with you. It's great to see you. I knew that wasn't your PCRM office. Like, uh -uh, he's on the road <laughs> again. Uh, before we dive in and spend an hour on, on hormones, uh, there was a uh, a, a paper, a report that was just released by Professor Walter Willett that helped us to 
uh, dive deeper to, to understand why milk does not do a body good. And you sent it to me and I've been going back and forth with your medical director um, as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, James Loomis, helping me to understand uh, all the intricacies of it. But I would love to hear from you just maybe your top kind of two or three co- um, findings um, and, and you know what, what Walter Willard summarized in the report uh, as to the main issues uh, involving human beings uh, drinking breast milk from a cow. It was absolutely groundbreaking because the New England Journal of Medicine is the biggest journal in the universe. And they gave this enormous uh, number of column inches to, it was actually Walter Willett, who is at Harvard, and also David Ludwig, also at Harvard. And the two of them wrote one of the most comprehensive reviews I've ever seen in any medical journal, all about milk. And they came down really, I think, very clearly saying, you don't need it. They, They made a very strong case that nobody needs it, but they went further. And they said, it's really quite clear that milk increases the risk of prostate cancer in men. And they went, they, they talked about many uh, different health issues. And one of the ones that they zeroed in on was fractures, because the, as they pointed out, um, protecting your bones is sort of the big selling point for, for consuming milk. And they really just disputed it. They said it doesn't protect your bones at all. If anything, it might do the reverse. Um, it might increase the risk of fracture. So anyhow, to, to have this come out in a really very clear way from some of the most prominent scientists in the world um, who are very, very well respected and to be in the, the, the most respected journal there is, I, I thought it really is just a signal that, that um, things are changing. And Dotsy, I have to say, it, you could have written this. It was exactly what you would have said. Um, and it came out of the, the, the mouths of, um, of these, of these uh, leading medical experts. Yeah, it was it was really fantastic. And as you know, um, we have a report coming out in June that is is uh, is upwards of 40 pages now that um, does it in a little bit of a different way, but is also obviously completely based on 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 facts and research, but um, also kind of a, a, a helping the public to better understand why this information um, of milk does a body good has been inundated uh, for so long and, and just sort of, sort of the history of the understanding of the advertising of the industry. So people can also get, okay, yes, it's not good, but why was I told something different my whole life? Um, really more for the, this is really more of a report for um, everyday folks, mm. right? That it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be too in the weeds. We'll have all the references, but not too in the weeds so that you know, just everyday people can pick this up and go, okay, I get it now. Mm-hmm. I can, I can understand. Can you explain actually why milk, which has calcium in it, is actually could be bad for our bones because yeah. people would, you know, you can tell them milk doesn't, isn't good for the bones, but they think, oh, but wait, there's calcium. So, and D, so that's not, yeah. uh, that might not be very convincing when I tell them that they need to switch okay. up. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the first thing that should be said is the researchers um, simply look at, does it protect your bones or not? Because if milk drinking people are breaking bones the same as, as much as people who don't drink milk, You've got to kind of abandon the theory and and that's mm-hmm. been pretty clear and so then they're asking your your question which is why why is milk no good it does have calcium in it it does have at least some vitamin d uh in it why is it a problem and so here people are are, are trying to understand that part of the reason is that although there is calcium in it the vast majority of that calcium is not absorbed by the body uh, in research studies it varies a little bit but it's about 68 percent of the calcium just isn't absorbed. It just goes right down with the wastes into the toilet. Um, so that's number one. Yes, there's calcium there, but you don't get most of it. Um, secondly, the vitamin D is not natural to the milk for the most part. It's it's added to it. It's it's fortified. And in fact, they, the authors, Willett and Ludwig, in the New England Journal made the point that if you want vitamin D and you want to supplement it, you can supplement it much cheaper than adding it to milk and buying the milk. Um, so they made a case against that. Um, some people have speculated that the dairy protein that is in milk may also aggravate the fracture risk. Um, who knows? But for, for whatever reason, it does not, A, it doesn't help, B, it might hurt. Mm, okay, with, regard to prostate, with regard to prostate cancer, it's an interesting thing because, uh, as you know, milk's purpose, if I can call it that, is to make a calf grow. And in a calf's body, 
uh, after the calf drinks milk, the calf's body makes more IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor number one. And that helps the calf to grow rapidly. So let's say I take a 55-year-old man or woman and I feed them cow's milk. And you take a blood sample and you find more IGF-1 in their blood as well. So take a test tube and mix that IGF-1 with prostate cancer cells. They grow like crazy. Uh, it's a growth factor. You can mix them with breast cancer cells, the same story. So milk helps a calf grow, but you don't necessarily want things to grow in your body. Um, and so anyway, um, all, of, all of these are, are really, I think, singing the death now of this um, old dairy science from the 1950s where you could try to make a case that it does the body good. It's, it's really quite the reverse. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to your book. So why did you write this book called Your Body and Balance About Hormones? What was, what was the inspiration for it? Um, people really don't understand this at all, and I thought it was important that they do, because hormones control everything in your body. Hormones are made in, in one organ, and they go to other organs, and they control everything about you. And we now know that if you can control your hormones, you control far more aspects of your health than you thought possible. And foods allow you to do that. So I'm speaking of uh, the ovaries. Uh, they make estrogen, and that will go to a woman's reproductive organs and affect them. Um, or testosterone that is made in a man's testes. It goes to his brain and makes him want to run for president. Um, mm -hmm. you just kidding. The, the thyroid gland makes thyroid really. hormone. <laughs> it makes thyroid hormone that goes to your body and gives you energy. Um, your, your pancreas makes insulin that goes to the cells of the body to allows them to take sugar inside. So um, hormones all have functions. And, and I have to tell you what, what got me onto this in the first place was a phone call. The young woman who called me up and she said, I can't get out of bed. I've got, many women have menstrual cramps to one degree or other, but for maybe one in 10, they're off the scale, I cannot work today, type pain. And doctors prescribe strong analgesics, they, start, they prescribe the, the pill, things like that. And she said, I, I gotta be on a plane tomorrow, I can't function, I can't move. So I said, well, I could give you painkillers for a couple of days, but how do we stop this next month? And the month after that, how are we gonna prevent this? So I, I suggested something to her that I don't think any doctor has ever suggested as a treatment for menstrual pain. I said, let's, let's try this as an experiment. For the next four weeks, no animal products at all. I'm gonna make you a, a vegan and keep oils to a bare minimum. And she said, I'll, I'll try anything. Yeah. But she, she called me back four, months, uh, four weeks later and her period started with zero symptoms at all, no pain. It was an absolute cure for her. And this continued month after month. So I then did a, a randomized clinical trial with Georgetown University's Department of OBGYN. It's a large group of women and it worked. It changed PMS symptoms and uh, bloating, moodiness, and also pain. Um, and so it, with a little effort, we figured out why this worked. And, and to cut to the chase, the whole reason I suggested this was that we have had scientific evidence for a long time that in women at risk for breast cancer, you want to reduce the amount of estrogen in their blood so that the, the estrogen doesn't drive the growth of cancer cells. And you could do that with a high fiber diet and a really low fat diet. So I thought, as the woman was calling me, I thought, what's happening in your body? Probably your endometrial lining, the lining of the uterus, is getting too much estrogenic stimulation that's causing it to, to, to thicken too much during the month, and that's killing you at the end of the month. So I thought, really high fiber, really low fat, what's that? That's a vegan diet. And that was the solution. But she also, she did find that if she stayed vegan but would add a lot of greasy stuff um, to her diet, then it would not work as well. So she really needed that combination. Oh, and I, one, one last thing. Forgive me for this long-winded answer. I got to tell you one last thing. Um, in, in this research study that we did, um, we asked all of the participants to not use any hormonal medications because that would confound the study results. So we wanted to zero in on that. And so that meant if they were on the pill as birth control, we would ask them to use some other method. And one of the research participants said, don't worry about me. I don't use the pill. I don't use anything. She said, I'm infertile. She said that she and her husband had been evaluated for why they couldn't conceive. 
And this was years ago, and she said, we were both evaluated, it's not him, it's me, I just don't ovulate, this is it, I'm infertile, I don't use contraception, don't worry about me, I don't take the pill. The second month that she was on the low-fat vegan diet, she came into our research center and she said, Dr. Barna, I've got some, some bad news and some good news. I said, well, what is it? The bad news is I'm leaving your study. And the good news is I am pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so she gave birth to a beautiful baby. And then she had a second baby. And then she had a third baby. <laughs> and, and so so here, here, here's, what, here's what I'm saying. The first woman I was describing, she, she had menstrual cramps. This is a, a diagnosis of dysmenorrhea. What I'm saying is erase that diagnosis. She was just not in balance. And this, this second woman, her name, her name is Elsa, she said, uh, she, she thought she was infertile. This is my diagnosis. Erase that. You're not infertile. You're out of balance. And, and this is the case for all hormones. Hormones can be too low. They can be too high. Nobody knows what they are. It's like somebody gives you the keys to a car and blindfolds you, and you're trying to find out where you're going. It, once you know how the, how the hormones work and how foods dial them in, you can get your estrogen on track, your testosterone on track, your thyroid hormone on track so you can feel decent, your hair can look good, your skin can look good. You can get your insulin on track so your diabetes can improve or go away. But most people have no idea and their doctors don't tell them because the science is evolving way faster than medical education. So anyway, I got all excited about it. And so that's that's the reason I wrote Your Body in Balance. Those are really well, good that's reasons great. to get excited. Yes, exactly. Um, so what I'm understanding is that hormones are Th things that are released from different organs and right. our food and what we ingest makes a difference on how much of those hormones are being released. And the, the amount of hormone um, uh, uh, governs how well something works or doesn't work. Is that? Is that yes, that, that, that's exactly right. And some foods ha actually have the hormones in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, let's go back to dairy. Uh, because that's really the, the one food that really stands out. There are many foods that cause your body's hormones to change, but dairy actually contains estrogens. Um, I don't need to tell you, um, dairy milk comes out of a cow. The cow is pregnant. The cow is impregnated annually on every, every dairy there is. And a gestation for a cow is about nine months. So what that means is nine months out of every 12, the cow is pregnant and they milk them through much of the pregnancy. So a cow makes estrogen anyway, but when they're pregnant, they make much more and it gets into the milk and it's detectable. And it, although it's, you could say it's only a trace, when you turn milk into cheese, it's more concentrated. The average person consumes 35 pounds of cheese every year, plus ice cream, plus milk, plus butter, plus yogurt, plus all the dairy that's baked into cookies and cakes. Everything. And, and everything. And so you're getting huge traces. And this has been found to affect men. Um, researchers went to a college campus. College students don't have the most exemplary diets. Um, and they took sperm samples from, the, from college men. And they found that the more cheese they ate, the lower their sperm counts. So they then went into a fertility center. Same thing. The men consuming the most cheese had the, uh, you, you can study sperm, sperm count. You can also look at their morphology, meaning their shape, and their motility, meaning can the little sperm swim straight. And all of that is impaired by cheese. And what it appears to be is these traces of estrogens goof up the man's fertility or re reduce his fertility. And what I'm, I'm, I'm learning in the last, oh, I'd say about three or four months on um, some of the large scale, high yield dairy farms is they're um, impregnating the cows right after they give birth to start the, the next cycle. So it's not even, they're not getting three month rest. Obviously not all, right? But some um, that is becoming common. So then when more research is done um, on this, we'll find not only the mammalian estrogens, strong estrogens from the, the birth that they just gave, but they're pregnant again while they're milking for the next yeah. month or six weeks. And so that ups the ante even more with the um, intensity of the estrogen in the milk. I, I, have to, I have to say, I'm a physician and I write books about science and health, but I, I have to say, hopefully we're also human beings. And when, when I have been looking into this, it's striking to see what these animals go through. Um, I was really unaware of what goes into artificially inseminating the cows every year. And they push them and push them to produce more milk. 
And a cow in nature lives about 20 years. On a modern dairy farm, they live about four because they say, you're just not putting out as much milk as we need. They kill the mama cow and then they start impregnating their, their daughters and so forth to get more milk out of them. It's, it's an strikingly abusive industry and uh, many people have gone vegetarian because, well, they don't want to eat meat. They don't want to kill the animals and they imagine they don't kill the dairy cows. They're all killed yeah. and so are their offspring. It's, it's, it's really a meat industry, only a, a slow one where they do all sorts of things to the animals before they, before they kill them. So it, I, my hope in, in raising this is that people who will sort of compromise their own health a little bit, well, that ice cream tastes really good. Once they realize the full impact of what you're doing to the environment, to have, what, you know, 90 million belching cows in the United States belching out uh, methane, and what you're doing to the animals that we have to share it with, uh, it, it really see, starts to seem quite uncivilized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and such a, just a, to, in my opinion, as a female, such a um, sadistic uh, abuse and use of the female reproductive system itself. I was just watching yesterday videos because I wanted to torture myself, uh, videos of calves being removed from their mothers. And it is awful. Um, and it's so ironic because not only do people th think that um, they're doing something good by giving up meat, and they're doing something better by giving up meat, but uh, it's okay with the dairy because they're not killed. They are killed, as you stated. But also, people will say, oh, well, I don't want to have any soy because that has a lot of estrogen in it. And then they will drink uh, milk. Can you talk to that a little bit? Oh, yes. Um, let's talk about soy. Um, uh, there's been a lot of misunderstanding on this, but luckily the science has come in. The jury is back in the room, and so we know the story. Um, soy does have what are called isoflavones. And the most uh, common one is genistein. And it does attach to the estrogen receptor. Um, you could see that we go to a breast cell and attach to the estrogen receptor. And so that caused people to worry. Um, if it's estrogenic, then for a man, it might make him infertile, or maybe it would um, cause man boobs, as you'll see all over the internet. Uh, could having tofu or soy milk give a man breast enhancement? And then could it cause breast cancer in a woman, or if she's had cancer in the past, would it make it grow? Um, well, luckily, we've had a lot of chance to, to study all of these things. And it's, first of all, very clear that, that soy does not impair fertility in men at all. And if anyone doubts that, go to Japan or China, where soy has been consumed for a long time, and you'll be quite impressed that their fertility has not been harmed. Um, secondly, it does not cause man boobs, and you can prove this yourself by going to a beach in August. And if you see a heavyset guy who's taken off his t-shirt, and if he has a little bit of what looks like breast enhancement, go up to him and ask him, how much tofu have you had this past week? <laughs> um, edamame, miso soup? Uh, what he's gonna say is, what are you talking about? I don't eat that stuff. Well, what do you eat? I eat cheeseburgers, um, I eat pizza. Um, what, what has happened? in his body is he's been eating animal products that have made him gain weight. And the more fat cells you have, the more estrogen is in a man's body. But fat cells are not just lifeless bags of calories, they are active factories making estrogen. So as, as he gains weight, he's got more estrogen in his bloodstream and that's causing the breast enhancement. It has nothing to do with soy and he's not eating soy anyway. And then it was with a regards, great real world example. <laughs> yes. I love that. Really? So, and, and, and by the way, at the risk of sounding a little sexist, you, you can tell me if this sounds, sounds sexist or not. Um, if, if Japanese women consume an enormous amount of soy, say compared to a woman in Idaho, but do people think of Japanese women as being particularly busty? Um, I don't really think that breast enhancement is, it's not a side effect of soy for men or women. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, with regard to women and breast cancer risk, um, the, the research is quite clear and quite consistent, and there are many, many studies where you can look at women who consume the most soy and women who consume the least soy. And in fact, if you want to look at the women who consume the most, look at, say, Asian Americans who, they might be westernizing their diet, but they still have tofu and they still have soy milk and so forth. They have a lot of it. Um, those women who consume the most soy milk, tofu, and other soy products have about 29% lower risk of developing breast cancer compared to other women who avoid soy. And then if a woman has been diagnosed with soy, uh, with, with cancer in the past, if a woman has been diagnosed with breast cancer 
and treated, her risk of dying of her cancer is cut again by roughly 30% if she consumes soy. Um, the women who avoid soy have roughly 30% higher risk of dying of their cancer. So to put it all together, soy products do not cause men to be feminized and they do not cause breast cancer. They do not cause it to advance. If anything, they reduce it. So this leads to the question, if the soy isoflavones attach to the estrogen receptor, then why is it that they're good for you? Why is it that they reduce cancer risk? And the analogy is in your car, you have a pedal on the floor of your car, it's called the gas pedal. And if you step on it, your car goes. But right next to it is another pedal and it's called the brake. And if you step on it, it stops. And soy is the brake. The, your, your, your cells have alpha receptors and beta receptors. And soy attaches preferentially to beta. So it's like a blocking it's, mechanism. Does it's it? a block, yeah, exactly right. And so I have to say where this really worries me is sometimes you'll get, um, even a, say an oncologist, a cancer specialist, who is not very knowledgeable in the nutrition side of things. Right. And they will sometimes on an offhand way advise women previously diagnosed with breast cancer to avoid soy. Yeah. And if they advise them that, they have just condemned her to a 30% higher risk of dying of her cancer than if they had said, if I were you, I would eat a lot of it. So <laughs> when you say when you say yeah. soy, though, I, I, we, we need to clarify that that doesn't mean there's so much processed soy. Is there a difference? I mean, I would assume you're talking about tofu and edamame, but what about yeah. soy protein isolate? I think I see in a lot of processed. Food. Yeah, yeah, th that's that's a terrific question. Um, there, there's lots of ways of looking at soy. Um, one is um, organic versus non. And the benefits probably go for both. But I personally always buy organic and I think, why not? You know, uh, if it's organic, not only has it not been rate, uh, not only have uh, pesticides and so forth not used, but by law, it cannot be GMO. So buy organic. And then the next question, is it fermented soy, like miso or tempeh or unfermented soy, like soy milk? And both of them work. It doesn't seem, we, we thought that the fermented soy was gonna be better. It, and the truth is they both seem to work with regard to cancer prevention. Um, so the final question then is processing. Um, if you grind the soybean up to make soy milk out of it, it still is effective, um, but it's possible to modify it so much and to extract the protein that it now simulates bacon and simulates sausage. And it raises the question as to whether those still have the benefits. Um, they still have one enormous benefit, which is that they saved you from bacon and sausage, which are clearly linked to breast cancer. There is no question that servings of any processed meat increases the risk of uh, both colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Um, but my, my guess is to, despite the fact that it sounds a bit unnatural, my guess is that it still preserves some of the benefit of the soil. Okay. Um, it, it has not really been tested, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily shy away from those foods, even though you're gonna just, people are all discover, the more they get into a plant-based diet, the more they want to have simple foods, mm -hmm. clean foods, foods they recognize, foods sort of minimally processed, and, and that's a good way to go. So I, I actually um, know several people right now with breast cancer. What is your dietary recommendation, uh, in a nutshell, no pun intended, for women with breast cancer? Yeah, well, first of all, everything that I'm going to say doesn't take the place of having a good clinician. So yeah. don't, fi don't fire your doctor. Uh, it, and, it, and if you're not getting what you need from your doctor, you definitely get a second opinion or a third opinion. Your health matters more than anything else. Um, however... Um, what I think, what I would strongly recommend is a completely plant-based diet. That means vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans. Do take a vitamin B12 supplement. This is not optional. Um, I would avoid dairy completely, including if you're at a restaurant and a little cheese was added inadvertently by the waiter to your spaghetti, take it off. This is not a chance. This is not the, t the idea to indulge. Just treat it like poison. Avoid it completely. I would keep oils low. Um, I would also lace up my sneakers a lot. Um, exercise really pays off um, as a, a cancer preventer and probably also for cancer survival. There is a fair amount of data that uh, the more you get involved in aerobic exercise, the better, it's, the better you're gonna be. Um, I would certainly eat for color. 
um, colors are antioxidants. That means the orange beta carotene in the carrot or the red lycopene in a tomato or the purple anthocyanins in blueberries and grapes, um, lots of color and lots of, and lots of fiber. Mm -hmm. um, what I would not do is uh, listen to friends who say, don't you want some wild caught salmon for omega-3? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> that, that fish is, not only does that, the fish have chemicals in it, but most of the fat is not omega-3. Um, and you, you know, it, it's going to clearly do more harm than good. So have some flax seeds, not the wild caught yeah. salmon. If you're... Um, yes, yes to flax seeds, but even more, um, people neglect, they're still neglecting their green leafy vegetables. I would have lots and lots of green leafy vegetables. They have, they have folate, first of all, which is a B vitamin that's involved in DNA repair. Mm -hmm. But you don't think of there as being a lot of fat in broccoli or kale, and there's not a lot. But if you send it to a laboratory, they would say of all the calories in this green vegetable, mm -hmm. seven or eight percent are from natural oils. And the proportion of them that's omega-3 is really, really high. Mm -hmm. So when, when people bring in the green leafy vegetables, I think, great, this is a natural source of calcium, the best form of iron I could get. But it's also, it gives you the traces of omega-3 that your body needs in the, in the most helpful form. I have a question um, about, since we're, which we're on the topic of hormones and, and women. Sure. Um, uh, in, in Dr. Um, Greger's book, How Not to Diet, he made a statement that if you're on a, you know, a whole food plant-based diet, um, that women can then decrease their, their need for regular mammograms. That was a little frustrating for me because it, it wasn't taking into consideration that a lot of women are on hormone um, specific dependent birth control. And I'm on uh, Depo-Provera, which increases my risk of breast cancer, actually decreases a little bit my risk for um, uterine cancer. Right. Um, so hormones are powerful. We know that we're, 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 we're setting that uh, pretty straight today. Um, is my whole food plant-based diet, and I'm asking this for all the women that are listening that are on Depo-Provera or, or the pill um, or any kind of hormonal-based birth control, um, is it protective enough? It's, it's a, a terrific question. And you could ask the same question about not just breast cancer, but also col colorectal cancer. Do you need to have a colonoscopy? Um, or for men, prostate cancer, do I need to get my PSA checked? And do I have to have that humiliating exam every year? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the answer is that nobody really knows. Um, and we're, what researchers are, are debating is in some cases do, and I know you, 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 you're aware of this debate, is do the tests do more harm than good in certain cases? Mm -hmm. by, by more harm than good, are they detecting what, what was actually never gonna be a problem anyway? And do they lead women? I, I personally am not so concerned when they say, well, the tests just make women worry. Um, I think, well, w women and men will worry anyway. I'm not so worried about that, but I am worried if it means you're gonna have to go to the operating room um, unnecessarily. Um, and, and I don't think anyone really knows the answer. Um, my suggestion is that we do take advantage of the power that a healthy plant-based diet gives us, but that I don't think that we should um, get smug about it because the human body is fragile and you can be on a darn good diet and you can still get cancer. Um, you could be on a great diet. You could still have cardiovascular disease or, or other things. Um, are, these things just happen. So whether that means that these diagnostic tests are, are necessary, that's another debate. But I, I would not change my recommendation for a test based on the fact that you're on a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That helps a lot of people. So you brought up birth control. So I'd like to bring up erectile dysfunction. Seems <laughs> like it's in the same... Um, sort of area of sex <laughs> so um i thought that erectile dysfunction was either psychological or as a, a result of clogged arteries from eating too much saturated yeah. fat um is there a hormonal tie or is are the hormones somehow mixed in there um it really isn't hormonal but i put it in this in this book and i have a, devoted a whole chapter to it simply because men think it's hormonal mm. and they just figure if i get a testosterone treatment I'll be fine. And, and what you said is, is exactly it. it. It's really not so much psychological um, for most men. When, when a guy has ED, and in fact, here's the scenario. This happens in every clinic every day. The guy walks in and he says to the doctor, doctor, I'm, I, I'm having trouble with my nature. And the doctor says, I'm not sure what, what you mean. He says, doc, I can't raise the flag. And so, oh, okay, I gotcha, gotcha. 
So the doctor says, uh, you, you're asking me for a Viagra prescription. That's what I need. So the doctor says, sure, you know, I can write you out a prescription. The patient grabs it, goes out of the room, says, thanks, doc. The doctor at that point stands up, runs out and grabs him and brings him back and says, wait, 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 wait. There's something I have to tell you. The reason that you have erectile dysfunction is that you have narrowed arteries. And the disease is called atherosclerosis. All it means is that cholesterol particles have irritated the walls of your arteries, creating little blister-like plaques to form. And that slows down the blood supply to your private parts. And if you don't get blood flow, nothing works. But the key is, if you have erectile dysfunction, that means you've got atherosclerosis in your entire body, including the coronary arteries to your heart, the carotid arteries to your brain. And here's the zinger. The doctor has to tell him that men who have erectile dysfunction have a much higher risk of a heart attack or stroke within the next four or five years. And so fair enough, take Viagra. It's not going to hurt you probably for most men, but you must change your diet. And there's only one diet that opens up those arteries again. And that's a diet that does not have animal fat in it and does not have cholesterol. Well, you say that happens in, in doctor's offices all over the country, but I don't think that does, does it? I mean, my understanding is that doctors are not telling people to change their diet so that yeah. be, to help their erectile dysfunction at all. Um, the, the first part of the story is is universal when a guy comes in. <laughs> okay, the second part is... The, the second part, um, it was about three or four years ago at our conference, uh, Steve Kopetsky from the Mayo Clinic who is a cardiologist there and, and very good one, um, really said to the assembled doctors that this is now, a he, he made it really clear that it is, it is not controversial anymore, that we now know that erectile dysfunction is a sign of cardiovascular disease. So at least among cardiologists, they, all, they are all convinced and it's, it's, it's not even a matter of debate. Um, a guy who comes in, he's 55, if you assume this is performance anxiety, frankly, um, you're putting that guy at very serious risk. You, you have to tell him what he's got. He's got a, diagno a diagnosis that he's not aware of because, because he just thought, well, you know, I'm older, I can't get it up, whatever. Uh-uh, you've got a disease that, that is going to kill you. So it's, it's now really pretty well accepted. Whether, whether doctors give that speech to the patients or not is another thing. And unfortunately, many doctors don't even employ a registered dietitian or any kind of nutrition expert, and they don't refer to them. In our clinic at the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, D.C., we have four registered dietitians on staff. And so this man would be made vegan by 2.30. So, <laughs> so, so let's, t let's keep talking about men and this. You mentioned testosterone supplementation. I think men do think, oh, if I can't get it up, then I must need more testosterone. Is there a yeah. link? You're saying there's not a link. But men That's do lose testosterone as they get older. Um, frankly, they had too much to start with. Um, I, <laughs> That's true. I often think the world would be a much better place and the political world would, would be better if there's a bit less testosterone. Um, but <laughs> um, no, uh, low, the, the testosterone is marketed like crazy and they, they invented a, a great new word, low T, yeah. which is a word we, we didn't have a decade or so ago. And it makes it sound like, oh, of course, you just got low T, we'll diagnose it, we'll give you injections, uh, or it comes in various forms. Um, and what happens to the guy is a lot of nothing. Um, he doesn't really feel better. It doesn't change his sexual performance. It was really a label in search of a disease. Um, now, th there are occasional cases where the man is legitimately low, particularly if he had a traumatic injury or something like that. Um, but mm -hmm. testosterone is wildly overmarketed mm -hmm. and has almost no benefit for the vast majority of users. About thyroid, I actually was diagnosed with hypothyroid. I don't know eight years ago, and because I didn't have any symptoms, I said I'm not going to take any pills. And then I waited another year, and I still had what was considered on paper low thyroid, even though I didn't have issues with my weight or my energy. Mm -hmm. And so she's the, my doctor scared me, and I take now I take thyroid because yeah. she scared me into taking pills, even though I didn't have symptoms. Tell, talk to me about that. Um, yeah, uh, this is an area that is really kind of a medical frontier, but let me tell you what we know. Um, your thyroid is this understated little Clark Kent of an organ that's very quiet. 
um, at the base of your neck. And it's shaped like a little butterfly, but it's big stuff. It, your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone that goes, travels through the bloodstream to all the cells of the body, and it gives you energy. And if you're hypothyroid, if you're symptomatic, the typical symptoms are you might feel kind of uh, fatigued or, or weak or tired. You might feel tend to feel cold. Um, some people start to gain a few pounds, um, not usually a lot, but you'll, you may notice it. Um, and your hair can seem dry or brittle. Um, your skin will change a little bit. Um, if you're hyperthyroid, it's the opposite. Um, now your, your uh, thyroid gland is creating too much thyroid hormone and you feel revved up. Um, many people lose weight. They feel on edge a lot. Their hair and skin will change as well because all of these things are, are affected. And so food affects us in two ways. The first is back in 1924, the Morton Salt Company started marketing those little blue cylinders with a little girl in the umbrella, and it was iodized salt. And the thyroid gland needs iodine to make thyroid hormone. And if you don't have it, people tend to run low. So in the past decade or so, many people have been using sea salt or Himalayan salt or kosher salt, which is not iodized. And so they're not getting much iodine and they end up hypothyroid because their thyroid is looking around for iodine. Now, you can use iodized salt if you want to, um, but it's, it has to say that on the label. If, if it doesn't say it, it is not. Um, the other thing, though, my favorite source is you go to the sushi bar and don't have the fish sushi unless you're extremely well insured, but um, have the, the cucumber roll or the sweet potato roll or the, the asparagus roll or whatever it is. The nori seaweed wrap is like like all seaweeds very high in iodine and the miso soup has a little wakame uh seaweed in it or your seaweed salad all, all sea vegetables that's nature's iodine source but of course if like me you grew up in north dakota you're not anywhere near the coast you, you thought seaweed was a weed and you just never had it um so so that's that's number one but the other thing is that certain foods can sometimes trigger an attack on the thyroid. Um, your white blood cells can make antibodies, which are like little torpedoes that attack a virus or attack a bacterium. And sometimes they'll attack you, they'll attack your thyroid. And what's this about? My white blood cells are making these antibody torpedoes that are attacking my thyroid um, and causing it to have trouble making thyroid hormone. Or they can attack the regulatory mechanism of the thyroid so it can't turn off. And now I'm making too much thyroid hormone. Um, foods appear to be able to trigger that uh, reaction. Which, which foods should okay. be? Um, I'm, I'm going to put them in three groups. Uh, group one is dairy. Um, and if you look, the Adventist Health Study looked at the prevalence of thyroid issues in people following different diets. And the vegans had the lowest risk of hypothyroidism. The group that had the highest risk was actually lacto-ovo vegetarians because they're not eating milk. They're, I mean, they're not eating meat, but they're making up for it with lots of cheese and lots of milk. So they, they had the highest risk. When it came to hyperthyroidism, again, the vegans did the best, but the people who did by far the worst were the omnivores, people eating milk and meat did much worse. And then the lacto-vegetarians were kind of in between. Um, so the, the first issue is dairy. The second issue is meat and other animal products. The third issue might be other things that, that aren't in those groups, such as some people have suggested gluten might play a role. Um, and we really don't know whether, whether that's the case. Um, some people have been invest, uh, trying to investigate cruciferous vegetables. Wait, why uh, would cruciferous vegetables, what, what's the, is it a very scientific me mechanism? Or we, is... we, we, don't, we don't know why. But the, the, reason, the reason that, and, and so far they're getting a not guilty verdict, but the reason people went down this road was they would look at lambs um, or other livestock that would consume huge amounts of certain vegetables and seem to have thyroid issues. And so they, they kind of did a leap into the human diet and say, well, if these kinds of plants would affect the animals, maybe they'd affect us too. Um, so far we're not seeing it, but who knows. Um, there has been some look at soy. In the Adventist population, women consuming a lot of soy, despite all the benefits I just mentioned, they did seem to have a little bit more tendency toward hypothyroidism. It was not a lot. Um, and in men, you didn't see it at all. So, and, and no other study has shown that. 
So we're trying to figure out if, if avoiding dairy and avoiding meat seems to be the biggest benefit, but we're trying to figure out is there some other dietary culprit? Mm -hmm. Or the obvious other thing is could there have been some kind of a passing infection? Um, we've, we've been wondering about this for type 1 diabetes in kids. Uh, milk is a possible contributor, but we're also looking at could there have been some passing infection where a virus got into you, triggering the production of antibodies that then happened to, to spray the, the uh, thyroid mm -hmm. and attack it. Um, so we're, we're right at, the, at the, the basis of this, at the beginning of this science, but in Your Body and Balance, I described several people who were following omnivorous diets mm -hmm. when they were diagnosed with either hypothyroidism or in some cases hyper and had a quick re resolution of their symptoms. So if you're hypo now, I would suggest, you know, and I'm sure you're doing this anyway, track with your doctor and just see where your levels are and see if you end up perhaps not needing your replacement down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could, th that's an ongoing negotiation um, that you can have. Well, yeah, one that I want to aim for. But I'm worried that I've tired, my thyroid has now gotten lazy because I've been taking the medicine and that it won't, uh, won't mm -hmm. yeah, be as effective. If yeah. You were, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, thank you. Um, sure. I would love to just um, shift for a minute to um, uh, young girls seeming to get their, their periods so much yeah. sooner. Um, I have a lot of friends with kids, and um, they're uh, getting their periods at 11 and 12. And I know my generation, uh, it, you know, we, it, was, it was pretty average around 16, 17. I got mine at 16. I remember my very best friend uh, next to me in the stall at school uh, screaming literal bloody murder. She was 15 and her period came. It was the middle of school. Uh, and we, you know, emergency went to the principal. Uh, and the principal said to me, because we were just horrified, uh, well, it's, you know, she's a little pudgy. So that might be why. Maybe she probably had a, a bit more estrogen would, would have been the reason. But nowadays, a, a 10, 11, 12, is it in the food? Is it in the, the plastics? Is it in the fertilizers? What is, why is this happening? Um, you know, what you said is, is so important. And if you look even back further, if you look back into the middle of the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, the onset of the first period in girls was around 17, 18. Um, and that makes, that's starting to make sense because you think at what age are you able to maybe take on some of the, the tasks of say, raising a baby, not when you're 11. No. Um, and frankly, I would say that a person is qualified to be a parent when they're about 55. Certainly, certainly not at 12 and 13 and 14. Um, and so it's obviously a biological aberration. And if you look at the graphs, the age of first period, period in girls has been dropping consistently for all this time. Um, and so this, this suspicion does fall on, on diet. Um, and it could be a couple of things. Um, we've talked about dairy consumption. And although dairy consumption has been very big in certain populations. It really hasn't been worldwide. And even in the United States, if you look back, 1909, the average American ate less than four pounds of cheese in a year. Um, today, it's 35, 36, 37 pounds of cheese. Um, and it's, it's just huge. And so, yeah, are, are kids eating more estrogen? They sure are. Um, and it, it is undoubtedly affecting their health in, 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 in various ways. But you can even go further back. Let's say a child is breastfed. Um, that child will grow up uh, gradually and will eventually be weaned uh, if that child's twin sister or brother happened not to be breastfed, just for some fluke, and was bottle fed. That child is going to grow quicker. Um, and of course, competing parents think, oh, isn't that great? My child's growing up fast. What you're doing is you're compressing their whole life. They grow up fast. They hit new puberty fast. They get cancer fast, and they die sooner. Um, a more protracted life course is healthier and easier on everybody. So what I'm saying is that when you basically treat children as if they're a calf and try to make them grow fast, they, they do. They hit these milestones earlier. Um, there could also be uh, just a role for more calories in the diet, which could go beyond dairy and just into food in general and sodas and all kinds of stuff that that does go into the kid and so if they do gain weight um it will increase their risk of all kinds of hormonal issues mm -hmm. um, these things could presumably affect uh boys as well 
So yeah, I'm quite concerned about that. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the intensity and the amount and the differences between dairy consumption back then and now, because you definitely have people say, oh, well, you know, I, I drank milk back then. We drank milk back then. And I did. I drank a glass of milk, I don't know, maybe every day, maybe every other day. But I barely remember having cheese. Every yeah. once in a while, my mom would make a Swiss cheese sandwich on must on rye with mustard. That was like her thing. And I'd have a little bit. Never had yogurt. We went to the ice cream shop like t- twice a month when it was affordable. So it, it, it was completely different than now when it's on on almost on every plate on every meal that children right. are consuming in excess um, they get a salad and who would have thought you know years ago a salad didn't mean cheese um right. and now it's got cheese and bacon and stuff all, all over it so it's added to everything um this has helped us to address an in, a, a, an interesting phenomenon in japan that when back in the 1960s japan was not a cheesecake eating country um it was rice and vegetables and although there was some meat or fish consumption, it was usually small amounts as a flavoring for the rice and the vegetables and so forth. And then with Westernization came more meat and more, more fish and also more dairy uh, in a previously pretty much non-dairy country. And several things have happened. Uh, the age of menarche seems to be dropping. Uh, menopause seems to be much rougher now. Um, back in the 60s, uh, when women were questioned about how do they feel during the menopausal transition, they would typically say, oh, I've got a little bit more backache than I did before. They wouldn't talk about hot flashes very much. It, it really wasn't the thing. And now it's become much more common. Breast cancer, of course, has doubled um, in, um, only among the women who westernized, not among women who did not uh, westernize. Diabetes is more common. And curiously enough, when I was writing Your Body in Balance, there's a whole chapter on mood. Yeah. And you cannot find major depressive disorder in Japan in the past. Now, I, I'm convinced it was there. It had to be there um, somewhere. And maybe they were just reticent and didn't want to talk about it. But it, came, it clearly increased with Westernization. Now, could that be that because we're overweight and we're, we're getting more diseases or whatever? Um, I, we don't know. But we have seen in many different populations that as long as the diet is, has abundant vegetables and fruits, it keeps a healthy gut microbiome that feeds back uh, into a healthier uh, brain regulation. And as soon as you uh, put lots of meat and animal products in the digestive tract, the bacterial populations change, and that seems to feed back negatively into mood control. Mm-hmm. You, you talked about anxiety too, which is something yeah. that, it, yeah. that's a term that I've just started hearing in the last couple of years about how people are really anxious and uh, so talk to us about how our, the foods we eat make us more anxious. Yeah, I have to say we, we stumbled into this just by accident. Al- almost all, all of these discoveries have been accidents that were then pursued mm-hmm. in research studies. And we were doing a study with GEICO, the, the car insurance company. And we, we just did this because they have a huge headquarters in the Washington, D.C. area right near my office. 2,500 people work there. They've got diabetes. They've got overweight, all kinds of issues. So we instituted a vegan diet at GEICO. And it was very successful. So we did a much bigger trial all around the United States in 10 different cities. And we found three things. That a healthy plant-based diet at work helped people to lose weight. We discovered that it helped diabetes to get under better control. None of that was a surprise. But the third thing was that we did, in paper and pencil tests, where we were tracking people's mood from day to day, depression and anxiety were remitting to a substantial degree. And nobody knew that we were looking at that. They, we, they, they wanted to join to just lose weight. But their mood was definitely improving, including specifically anxiety and specifically depression. And then we looked at job absenteeism. And people just weren't taking days off, you know, to be sick um, to the extent that they had been before. And we, at first we thought, well, this is just a fluke. But then we started looking at, uh, first, the gut microbiome, as I described earlier, gets, is changed. Secondly, um, Dairy products and meat cause increased inflammation. And I know you've talked a lot about this. Inflammation doesn't affect just your exercising muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, it affects your brain. Uh, what I mean is your immune system is making inflammatory chemicals that are in your bloodstream, and they go to the brain. And it is now known it, these um, contribute clearly to depression and anxiety, which are really two halves of the same, same coin. So we need more research on this, but researchers have started to do uh, trials 
comparing plant-based diets to uh, dairy consuming diets or meat consuming diets, the vegans seem to do the best. And I'm going to hypothesize mm -hmm. that the people who will do the best of all are the people who follow a completely plant-based diet and get regular aerobic exercise. Um, a good 45 minute, good sweat three times a week. I would bet that that combination would probably rival the best antidepressants that we have. Yeah. So forks, fingers, and feet, right? No smoking, yeah. adding no smoking to that. Oh, Moving that your feet, fingers, right? But... And what's on the end of your fork? So the anti-inflammatory foods are, the, sorry, the inflammatory, so the yeah. inflammatory foods are dairy, meat, and oils, and processed food. Is that what, I, what I'm hearing from you? Yes, with a special emphasis on the first two. And the other thing is part of the process of inflammation is when cells are inflamed and they're trying to knock out a virus or a bacteria or whatever, um, they're, they're increasing the production of free radicals in the body. So that to the extent that you have more antioxidants, that knocks that out. So where are the antioxidants? I don't need to tell you. It's in the colorful uh, and neglected uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and to some extent, the vitamin E is in nuts and seeds a little bit too. That's great. When you wrote this book, um, what surprised you? A story, uh, something, it, God forbid, scientifically that you hadn't known yet. <laughs> I know that's impossible. Uh, but what, what, what after you finished it thought, wow, that, that aspect was, was, uh, was pretty shocking. I, I hate to say this, but what has shocked me is my own profession. Um, I'm a medical doctor. And I went to a darn good medical school, <laughs> you know, um, and I practiced in this country all my career. And I'm struggling to come to grips with the fact that our profession has been so ready to take up a prescription pad and to turn on the lights in the operating room when that, without using the healing power of the body. Now, I, I don't mean to, to be, um, overly philosophical about it, but just to state the obvious, if you cut your skin, a band-aid doesn't heal you. Your skin has, within the DNA, is the blueprint for healing a cut. Um, the skin cells know to join again, and if there was a severed capillary or blood, other blood vessels, they will rejoin. And the band-aid doesn't do that. That's, that's, that healing mechanism is in the body. If you have a broken leg, your past doesn't heal you. Um, it's in your DNA to, to allow the healing to occur. Um, but if you pick at that cut every day or you don't have a good cast and so the bones wiggle around, the healing process will never occur. So we have people, the guy's got erectile dysfunction and it, let's say nobody ever talks to him about the fact that he's, if he gets the cholesterol out of his diet, the animal products out of his diet, his own body will heal. Um, atherosclerosis can be reversed to a substantial degree, enough to affect symptoms very quickly. Um, the 14 year old girl who's been told your, your pain, that means you're going to miss the debate squad tonight, or you're not going out for the basketball tonight. Mm -hmm. Welcome to adulthood. This is just what it's like to be a woman. This is your curse. Um, go to the doctor. Let's, I know you're kind of young for this, but we're going to start you on birth control pills. So that'll regulate your period. What the heck are we doing? Um, what we ought to be doing is using the healing power that the body has. Um, now, I'm going to forgive my profession a little bit because much of what I'm saying was not known. When I discovered that, that this condition called dysmenorrhea or menstrual cramps could be responsive to a high fiber, low fat diet, I, I don't think any doctor ever suggested it. And nobody until we had done the randomized trials had ever tried it. And when the NIH gave my team a grant to find a better approach to type 2 diabetes, that was really the first time the doctors started to say, okay, all right, we've got to take this seriously. And many of them are still not up to speed. So what's, what has surprised me is that doctors are so quick to grab the latest anti-inflammatory or, you know, when Humira is out or whatever, every doctor is there despite the fact it costs 30 grand a year. To, um, but when it comes to powerful dietary regimens that are the safest treatment we have, often the most effective, and all the side effects are good ones. We are way too slow to use it, and that has got to change. Well, thank you for this. This uh, book, Your Body in Balance, is going to be is part of that change. So thank you so much for writing it. There's a lot of new information in here, folks. So 
Oh, well, thank you. And, and let me brag for a minute. If, if you don't mind, I want to brag about the recipes because they were done by Lindsay Nixon, who you know is the happy herbivore. And I hooked up with Lindsay because she's just great at making recipes. But when she, And she sent them to me. They're not too many ingredients. They're easy to make. They're quick. They taste great. However, um, she sent them to me with a note that I included in the book where she said, Dr. Barnard, I didn't tell you this. Um, the diet changes that you recommend cured my menstrual cramps. And I thought, Okay, oh, that's, that's about so cool. <laughs> so, so many people have these issues, and I thought, good heavens, let's let's get healthy. The, the the body is imperfect, but let's let's treat it as well as we possibly can. And 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 more importantly, let's get the word out to to young people. And and that's why I want to thank both of you because you reach out to people, people forward links to your to to your program, and so you can have people who never they never heard this from their doctor, they're hearing it from you. And I am so grateful for all that you do. You, you, you talk to more people in a day than any doctor does in any given day. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. We need to get this book in uh, every clinic and every doctor's office and every nutritionist. So maybe we should just go on the road and just hand them out. Like you <laughs> handed it out to us, your friends. We need to get it to those people that you were surprised by. So in your travels, Dotsie. You okay. Can... <laughs> all right. Send me like a hundred and I'll, I'll start there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. That was great. We really appreciate it. Great talking with you. Back. Thank you for everything. Enjoy Miami. Soak up some sun for us. All right. Come back to Washington. We still need you. I will be there next month. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye. I'll make the best. Thanks. See ya. <laughs> Love it. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you.